All right. I think um, let's go ahead and get started. So just we can be respectful of everybody's time. You're welcome to put yourself on video. We'd love to see your faces as you get to see ours. Um, I'm Lori Arguez. I'm Director of Strategic Communications here at NOAA and delighted to be moderating the panel with several of my wonderful colleagues who represent um, different parts of NOAA, literally from the outer of the space to the inner of the ocean, of the deepest, darkest uh, of both and all of the things in between. And so delighted to have you all join us as we get to um, know a little bit more about our senior policy advisor team here at NOAA. Um, many of you know that NOAA does cover all sorts of uh, ground and ocean and space, and you will find that represented on our panel today. Um, if you aren't already aware, it's been a big week for NOAA, uh, particularly with respect to coastal resilience and investments in climate resilient communities. Uh, we just announced our a framework for our um, Inflation Reduction Act funding, which is a wonderful complement to the bipartisan infrastructure law funding. Uh, both of those are significant investments um, spearheaded by the Biden administration and certainly supported greatly by Congress. Um, and so we have lots to talk about. Uh, so let me begin by, I'm gonna ask each of my colleagues to introduce themselves. I think we're looking like we're pretty full. We're we're getting folks in the room here. So I'll just quickly introduce myself again. Lori Arguey is Director of Strategic Communications. Delighted to be here with my colleagues and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves um, and provide you a little bit of an overview of, of their portfolios just as we get started. So Katie, um, since there was a lot of discussion this morning at Capitol Hill Ocean Week around offshore wind, why don't we go ahead and begin with you? Thank you so much, Lori. And it's an honor to be on this panel with my uh, distinguished uh, colleagues at NOAA. Uh, my name is Katie Westfall, and I'm a senior advisor to NOAA Fisheries Assistant Administrator Janet Coit. And as Lori mentioned, I specifically work on offshore wind issues. Uh, we heard from Dr. Spinrad this morning about the importance of achieving our offshore wind energy goals uh, while protecting marine biodiversity and achieving ocean co-use. And that is largely what I work on. Uh, so in addition to directly advising Assistant Administrator Coit, I also liaise internally within the federal government uh, across agencies uh, with Congress and with external stakeholders. So in particular, I've been working with developers, uh, the fishing industry, states, tribes, and others to really develop and deepen uh, partnerships at both regional uh, and national levels. Uh, in addition, I'm also looking at bigger picture ways of improving the permitting process and coordinating um, across federal agencies and with external stakeholders. So with that, I'll, I can get back to you. Thank you, Katie. Let me turn it over to Christine, who has a very interesting and complimentary portfolio uh, to lots of the discussions that we've been having in the ocean world this last week. Christine. Thank you, Lori. Uh, hello all, my name is Christine Joseph. I'm a special advisor to, in the Office of Space Commerce advising the director, Richard Dalbello. And it might be surprising to hear that there's an Office of Space Commerce inside of NOAA, uh, but in fact, NOAA is very involved in the space world. NOAA operates uh, our fleet of weather satellites, monitoring climate change impacts. Um, NOAA also runs the Space Weather Prediction Center and uh, looking at weather, solar weather events coming from the sun. And so I'm inside of the Office of Space Commerce, specifically working on a topic area called space situational awareness. So looking at all the satellites up in space, how they're orbiting, try to get a better sense of where they are and where they're going and how we can work towards coordinating this traffic better in the future. So right now that responsibility sits with the Department of Defense and we are working towards trans transitioning a lot of that responsibility um, from the Department of Defense for commercial and private um, satellite owners and operators. Uh, so it's a lot of different technical issues, policy issues um, that sit within NOAA as well. And in addition, the office also does a lot of policy and advocacy activities in terms of um, advocating for the commercial space industry and also regulates um, remote sensing. So if you have a satellite that takes a picture of the earth, you actually need, and you're a commercial company, you need a license from our office. Uh, so that's just 
brief overview of kind of what the office does. I focus specifically on space situational awareness policy. And thank you all for joining. Um, so we have lots of people who have been very busy this week, not the least of which is Liam Burke, who is very involved in the Inflation Reduction Act. So Liam, let me turn it over to you. Thanks, Lori. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Liam Burke. I'm a Congressional Affairs Specialist within NOAA's Office of Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs. Um, as part of that role, you know, my job is to be some of the congressional facing sort of part of the of the agency. Um, I do a lot of liaising with members of Congress and their staff, setting up meetings with different stakeholders within NOAA to talk about legislation that's being developed, policy concerns, administrative concerns, funding opportunities and implementation, sort of what Lori was uh, was you know talking about getting into there, the Inflation Reduction Act. Also part of my portfolio, I work within a, a small team within our office um, that does a lot of the sort of messaging, a lot of the communication and sort of coordinating between our agency and Congress and the executive branch to make sure that we're on the same page and making sure that our projects are getting built and that everybody's aware and everybody has opportunities to apply to you know, different pools of funding and, and things like that. Um, I also do the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations portfolio within the Ledge Affairs team. So that means working with the NOAA Corps, which is NOAA's uh, uniformed service, who runs our fleet of ships and aircraft. NOAA has 15 ships and nine aircraft that do everything ranging from charting and mapping off the coast to fishery surveys, to flying into and out of hurricanes during hurricane season to take really precise measurements on storm strength and intensity um, and working closely with other NOAA offices like the National Weather Service to keep communities safe. So really happy to be doing this and, and really happy to be uh, with you guys today. Thanks, Lori. Thank you so much, Liam. And we can't continue to do what we do today without engaging the leaders of tomorrow. And so it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lauren Gibson, who has an interesting new portfolio, one that has never been had at NOAA before. So Lauren, take it away. Thanks, Lori. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lauren Gibson. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am the new special advisor on youth engagement uh, to Dr. Spinrad, our NOAA administrator. Uh, like Lori mentioned, this is a brand new position. Uh, we just started in January, and the position itself hasn't existed until now. So super excited to be kind of working on blazing new trails and figuring out uh, alongside Dr. Spinrad what it might look like for NOAA to engage more meaningfully with young people. Um, so within my portfolio, I kind of span the range of what we consider young people, um, starting in middle school, high school range, trying to figure out how to get those young voices into our strategic and policy decisions. How can we make sure that youth voices are actually being incorporated as the important stakeholders and allies that they are in our climate work, um, in our work from everything from, from fisheries to satellites to climate and beyond. Um, so that's part of my work. I'm also trying to make sure that as these young people go through our programs, we have an amazing array of uh, undergraduate and graduate scholarship opportunities through NOAA's Office of Education. Once they get through those programs, making sure that they have a way to successfully transition into our workforce, um, making sure that we're using things like direct hire authority and other uh, programs effectively to make sure that we really um, are able to make sure that the amazing young talented folks um, can get a foot in the door at NOAA or in other places uh, that they might uh, be interested in going to. Um, and alongside that, uh, really focusing on trying to make sure that the, the group of young people that we're working with really reflects uh, the demographics of the United States, making sure that we're centering diversity, equity, and inclusion in all of our work there, um, which I think will transition nicely into what Zach is working on. So I'll turn it back over to you, Lori. And, and I will turn it directly to Zach, who also has a very interesting portfolio and a relatively new one for, uh, for NOAA, at least um, in the last couple of years. And so we are very, very likely to have Dr. Zach Penny part of the, um, of the policy team here. So Zach, take it away. 
Oh, thanks, Lori. Lots of familiar names on this. So thank you, everybody who showed up today. Um, so yeah, I'm Zach Penny, and I'm the senior advisor to Dr. Spinrad, uh, the administrator on fisheries, as well as tribal engagement, which is the, the newish portfolio that Lori just mentioned. Um, as many people are probably aware, the fisheries portfolio is substantial, that we need to have lots of people, awesome people like Katie, working on all the multiple pieces, given the you know, regulatory nature of that line office within NOAA, but also everything else, whether it's the federal, federal management out in the ocean, um, even for anadromous fish inland and places like that. So um, a lot of what I do is provide uh, guidance and perspectives um, where I'm needed. And I, I'll be completely honest in that um, I, I actually have lots of limitations when it comes to different fisheries around regions of the US. I'm from the West Coast. Um, so um, definitely my expertise lies in uh, the Pacific Northwest, Alaska with salmon and things like that. So um, when something comes up, like for example, in the Northeast, um, I you know, work closely with the different regions on those places and see where it can be most helpful. Um, on the tribal engagement piece, that's sort of all things NOAA. So that crosses all of NOAA's different line offices. Um, it's a lot of things and just, you know, the tribal engagement portfolio, I, I'll, again, another little bit of honesty, I don't think I'm going to go down in history as the great engager, uh, but like, uh, Tribal engagement for NOAA is, uh, you know, a lot of things. It's perspectives, priorities that we need to sift through. What NOAA does in its process, a lot of our ceremony, a lot of our own bureaucracy, because um, you know there's there's a lot of uh, blind spots that different federal agencies have within Indian country, and so you know I do my best to provide those perspectives so we can be more effective in how we address those needs. And you know, just thinking of you know NOAA as you know one of the really important environmental stewardship agencies within the federal government, but tribes have been stewards of the lands and waters of the con lot, lot, a lot longer than anybody else, and um, oftentimes ecosystems suffer when tribes are absent from the landscape or silent. So um, these are perspectives I've been happy to bring to NOAA, and I'll leave it at that, uh, Lori. And we are delighted to have your perspective as well as those of your colleagues. I, I want to open it up for questions, but before I do, so start getting your questions ready and you can raise your hand, uh, let's see, or put it in the chat um, if you have a question. Um, but I'd love to hear everybody's know what origin story. I mean, I think it's always so interesting to know, you know, kind of like, Noah literally touches the life of every person in this country every day, which you may or may not have known before you came into this agency. Um, so let's go back to the beginning. And Katie, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you came to Noah and how either your personal or professional life might have been uh, in touch with Noah prior to your arrival? Absolutely. Thanks, Lori. Um, so I came to Noah um, with about 15 years of natural resource conservation experience. And I've really worked at the intersection of environmental policy and politics and science and communications. And most of my work in that realm has really been on the NOAA fisheries side. So, you know, I, I have really loved working on fisheries issues for a really long time and had interact with, interacted with NOAA fisheries in that capacity. Most recently, I was uh, the Senior Director of Resilient Fisheries at Environment, Environmental Defense Fund. And in that role, I really worked with fishermen, uh, industry reps, supply chain actors, chefs, technology providers, policymakers, researchers, um, in a really kind of dynamic role uh, to improve the sustainability and economic performance uh, and resilience of wild capture fisheries. Um, and then prior to that, I had worked as a NOAA Canals uh, Fellow on the Hill for in the office of Congressman Jared Huffman. So my journey had also had sort of a uh, a, a Sea Grant, um, you know, uh, chapter, which I know there's probably many, uh, you know, former fellows uh, and maybe some current fellows in the audience uh, today, and it's really just a wonderful program. So I got a little bit of exposure to one of the many things that NOAA does uh, through that experience. And then prior that, to that, had worked on a variety of other uh, conservation issues. Um, so when I had the opportunity, opportunity to join the uh, no fisheries team. It was it was a no brainer and, and a total honor and pleasure for me. Yes, canals fellows are. I used to say they will take over the world, and now I can say in present tense they are, and it's wonderful to see. I'm I'm delighted. Uh, Christine, tell us a little bit about your Noah origin story. Sure, uh, my path has been definitely 
quite zigzaggy over the course of my life. Um, I came, I started out more on the aerospace engineering side, I used to work in private industry. Um, but my previous job was over on the Hill uh, with the House Science Committee, uh, under which certain aspects of NOAA fell under their jurisdiction. So that's where I got more involved in learning more about what the Office of Space Commerce inside of NOAA specifically does, other uh, jurisdictional things in terms of um, NOAA's weather satellites and kind of just the sheer breadth of everything that NOAA does. Um, so it's, it's been kind of going back and forth between first working on the aerospace and aviation side, um, then getting onto the space policy and issues working on the Hill and now getting to apply that in both using those technical skill sets and um, those policy insights come in really handy while we're trying to stand up this um, space situation awareness system while um, there's more and more objects getting added to space. Um, so it's constantly growing and it wasn't, I was very excited to come and work over here, especially um, with everyone here on the screen here um, and everyone I've met so far and my relatively recently new time here. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Liam, over to you. We've had um, lots of connections to the Hill, um, which is where you get to spend a lot of your time. And um, so tell us a little bit more about your origin story at NOAA, which may or may not involve the Hill previously. It certainly does now. <laughs> totally. Well, I mean, I can go all the way to the beginning. I really, I sort of grew up in NOAA's shadow. Um, I, you know, my hometown where I grew up and where my folks still live is a stone's throw from Greater Farallon's National Marine Sanctuary. And I remember when I was a kid, you know, my mom would take me up the mountain and on a really clear day, you could see it. And she would always say, look for the Farallons. Um, and, you know, at the time I didn't really, I had no conception of what that meant, you know, for, you know, in terms of NOAA, um, but it was always a part of my life. And, um, you know, like you mentioned, I came to NOAA from the Hill. I worked for a few years for Senator Alex Padilla from California in his environmental policy portfolio. So I was supporting the senior policy advisors on the oceans and climate and environment portfolio. So I was able to get some exposure to sort of the broad issues. Um, but because NOAA is so important to California, NOAA had its own sort of portfolio bucket that I got to work on as well. And so I was able to get some familiarity, ironically, with the members of the team that I now work on. As I would, you know, I'd be emailing them from, you know, my Hill office. Uh, and now, you know, I always joke that I'm doing my old job in reverse. Where, you know, where I was on the Hill facing the agency, and now I'm in the agency facing the Hill. But sort of like you mentioned, I've been able to take those relationships um, and really leverage that to Noah's benefit. And it, it really helps to have those connections where I can just call someone that I've had a relationship with and say, hey, what's going on with this? And we can just chat about it and sort of swap information. Um, and I can, I can, you know, keep my team abreast and keep the, keep the policy team up to speed. So that's been really useful. Thank you, Liam. Lauren, over to you. Yeah, I'll start pretty early like Liam did. Um, so I actually got my start in, in all of this work uh, in middle school as a young environmental activist. Um, so I have been interested in the environment for a very long time, uh, but I grew up in Indiana, pretty far away from the ocean. So I wasn't really thinking in terms of uh, marine science uh, or, or anything along those lines. Uh, but in undergrad, uh, I was studying environmental science and environmental communication, and I had the chance to apply to a Stanford in government uh, internship opportunity uh, in partnership with NOAA. Uh, so I ended up interning my sophomore year of undergrad with NOAA, uh, actually with Dr. Spinrad um, when he was chief scientist of NOAA, um, our current administrator back in his chief scientist days. Um, and when I was a part of that team, uh, they convinced me that I did have a place in NOAA, even though I did not know much about the oceans or about weather, uh, that I could still bring a useful perspective. Um, and they convinced me to apply for the Canals Marine Policy Fellowship. So like Katie, also came in as a Sea Grant Fellow uh, in 2018 uh, with NOAA's Office of Education um, and absolutely fell in love with the agency. Um, the Office of Education couldn't get rid of me. I stayed on as a contractor uh, full time for a while. And then I went back for my PhD and stuck around with them part time. 
and eventually got connected with Dr. Spinrad's efforts on youth engagement um, and kind of wiggled my way into that portfolio and uh, ended up being able to find a place on this team after I graduated with my PhD back in December. Um, so all a bunch of serendipitous things happening uh, one after the other that led me to NOAA and I couldn't be happier to be here. And I, I feel like I, I'm honored to be in this position now trying to get more opportunities for youth advocates as a past youth advocate and, and being able to kind of use that experience um, and, and remembering what it was like uh, being a young person trying to enter these, these kind of scary spaces um, and trying to make those spaces less intimidating um, and more empowering for other young people. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren. I, I love that we have lifers, you know, one way or the other with Noah. Um, Zachary, bring us home. Yeah, we should have ended with Lauren. That that was great, Lauren. Like, I'm going to be a little bit more flippant. Like, I didn't know <laughs> Noah existed until I was an undergrad uh, in a little school that doesn't exist anymore up in Sitka, Alaska. And I remember seeing these little Sea Grant posters about undergraduate opportunities. But also when I was in Sitka and Sitka Sound, before it was ever the Sitka Sound uh, Sea Life Center, there was all these different researchers and folks coming from big schools from all of the other places because of what Sitka had at its disposal. But I remember seeing Sea Grant constantly and occasionally looking into those, but also like in Sitka, the one of the NOAA ships would occasionally stop by. I think it, they, it was one of the cutters, or at least that's what they called it. I remember always driving by it um, in a, a little boat that we had up there and like you see all the, like the radar stuff and other things on top of it. And I didn't actually know what uh, Noah was at that point, so I assumed it was everything about the weather service. I had no idea that there was even a, a fisheries piece to that, but also I was serenading the panel here before we all hopped on about past Alaska stories. Um, I used to work in really remote sites in southeast Alaska, and one of the weather channels, uh, well, the weather channel was a, a constantly on and listening to that NOAA synopsis every day sort of to make me a bit more aware of the agency, but just to be quickly given the time that we have, um, when I left Sitka and I, I finished my master's at the University of Victoria, I went back and worked for my tribe. I'm a Nez Perce tribal member, uh, Nimipu, and um, we ran a coho, I ran a coho project in Idaho that was funded by Pacific Salmon Coast Recovery Fund money, which, um, you know, a lot that, you know, comes, you know, through NOAA. And, um, you know, that was kind of, you know, one of those places where you start to see some connections being made. Um, after my PhD, um, just because a lot of the things that I do, anything dealing with treaty rights, trust responsibility, there's a trust or a policy intersection with a lot of things with regards to you know, tribal fishing rights and fisheries in general that, you know, I was sort of talked into doing, um, going on a policy route. So I am one of the many Canals fellows, actually one of the two Huffman <laughs> alumni Canals fellows on this call. Um, and you know, got more involved and, and connected to NOAA. Um, when I finished my Canals Fellowship, I went and worked for the Columbia and Tribal Fish Commission, which is where I was before I arrived here as a, a senior advisor. And um, you know, my relationship with uh, NOAA at Critfic was actually sometimes we were on the other side of the table. Sometimes we were suing NOAA. Um, and but you know, we worked with NOAA at, as on a variety of different things. One of those things uh, was the Columbia Basin Partnership Task Force, which was led by Barry Thom, who is the uh, regional administrator at the time and so happy about kind of the work that we developed out of that for sort of, you know, changing our targets on what we were actually going for, for salmon restoration, not just aiming for the delisting goals, which should be the lowest possible goal you have, but aiming for more healthy and harvestable stocks for everybody. And so, um, you know, definitely have worked on both sides with NOAA and, um, you know, at times it was, have been frustrated with the agency, but uh, here I am now wearing a NOAA vest and um, I only wear a vest if I'm proud of what I'm doing. Well, we're very glad that you are wearing that vest and we're very proud of you too, Zach. Um, so I am delighted to open it up for questions. Um, for those of you who don't regularly use Zoom, you can go to the reactions tab and raise your hand uh, if you have a question for any of our panelists. I will do my best to keep looking through um, all of the pages of people who are here. You can also um, put something in the chat as, as folks are doing. 
Um, yes, Hoosiers are awesome. We love the middle of the country, even though we tend to focus a lot on coastal things. Um, it is a big, broad noosphere, and we are all proud to be in the various different parts of it. So, um, anybody have a question? Want to make a connection, a deeper connection with any of our folks? I have a few more questions, so I'm I'm happy to keep the conversation going. Um, but okay, so Mike Murray, um, hey Mike, how are you? Um, so Mike's question is, how are you feeling about NOAA's efforts to improve engagement with Indigenous communities? And Mike is out at the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary in lovely Santa Barbara, where I had the pleasure of growing up, and where Mike still gets to live. Oh, hey, Mike, thanks for the question. Thanks for the, the hard question, because it really, so far, I mean, uh, you know, broadly for NOAA, I mean, the different line offices all seem to have um, sometimes different relationships with Indian country. Um, you know, with the fishery side of things where, you know, we talk about regulations and definitely that's where I'd say both fisheries and actually sanctuaries piece where consultations, you know, government to government consultation is really important given the connection to tribes and, and, and uh, you know, the landscape or seascape and what that is. Um, I think, you know, some of our efforts, uh, you know, it dep depends on the area, but I mean, I, I, our tribal team has been doing uh, really good things on, you know, updating our consultation documents. NOAA was one of the first to develop an indigenous knowledge uh, handbook, which actually came out before the White House. There's actually a lot of NOAA DNA in the, the White House's indigenous knowledge guidance, as well as an NAO. But um, a lot of relationships, you know, tribes, um, you know, speaking a bit more coarsely, you know, the, the trust, and I'm not talking about trust responsibilities, actual trust that tribes have with different agencies, different offices. I mean, sometimes it just comes down to the people. I mean, bad experiences that they've had with a administrator, one staff person, you know, those carry through a lot of times. So sometimes it takes a lot of work to regain that trust. And also, I mean, you know, NOAA isn't responsible for all the things that have happened, you know, to fisheries or, you know, things within Indian country. But um, I do think that NOAA is making some really big strides forward. Um, one of the places, and I think this is, um, uh, this is sort of a, pardon me for being a little rambly here, but a confluence of, you know, a lot of the Western science approaches that we do, whether it's in fisheries, whether it's in, um, you know, oceanography, or even, you know, even perhaps even space commerce, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, a lot of the things that we do um, need to be probably open to some of these perspectives, because indigenous knowledge, I, I think, I still think, not just NOAA, but a lot of the federal agencies um, you know, acknowledge, appreciate, respect what it is, how you actually get that into the decision making is a completely different thing. One place that, you know, it, that's really, you know, deserves a lot of attention and sometimes it's almost a said to a, you know, a cliche, but co-production of knowledge is a really important thing. And when you have groups of, you know, people, tribes, you know, underrepresented communities that don't feel like they've had a voice at the table, probably one of the quickest ways to integrate those perspectives into decision making is through things like co stewardship, um, you know, uh, I'll say co management, although there's there's definitely some legal pieces of co management we don't need to get into. Um, and that co production of knowledge. So I think NOAA is doing well on many fronts. Actually, I think that some of the sanctuary stuff that's happened, particularly out in like Hawaii, is, is you know, leading example of where NOAA has really done that well, but there's definitely other places where we can do better. Thank you, Zach, for being so um, clear in your thinking about this. I, mean, I think that while, while there's a lot about NOAA to love as a regulatory agency, it can be a challenge um, for sure. And I'm offering again for questions if folks have some things that they would like to talk with our policy advisors about. Um, you can also put a note in the chat as Mike did. Um, and, you know, sort of to keep the conversation going in the meantime, um, let me maybe start, uh, Liam, with you. What's the most surprising thing that you have discussed about NOAA that you maybe didn't know from the time that you started looking at the Farallones as a kid? What, what has surprised you the most about the vastness of this agency? You said it exactly, the vastness. I had no idea how wide and how deep 
the footprint of Noah was. Um, I mean, I had like, I had some awareness when I was on the Hill, but it was, it wasn't until I, I took this job and I started like really digging into, you know, line items and all the different offices and making connections that there was like 12,000 people all over the country and that the line offices touch, you know, sea and sky and land and everything in between. I mean, we, you know, we're talking a little bit about how NOAA tends to have a coastal bias, but there is a, a National Weather Service office in every region of the country. So NOAA's got a footprint all over. Um, and I didn't, it was, I think the moment where that really sank in for me was, um, I think I needed some IT help. And when I realized, I was like, I think I was, I was at Omeo or something like that. And like they had their own, this one division had its own specific IT office, like not a huge division, had its own IT team. And when I saw that, I went, wow, this agency is really big. <laughs> if they've got their own computer team for this, like 15 people. Um, and so that, I think that has probably been the most surprising thing for me. Yeah, the vastness for sure. And um, I, I think the events that you have the OMAO portfolio, um, hurricane hunters, most people have no idea that there are people who actually fly into hurricanes essentially for a living. And um, they do and it they, repeatedly. <laughs> you know, I mean, over and over, all hurricane season. It's incredible. <laughs> Absolutely. And as Dr. Skidrad, our no administrator is fond of saying these days, our, our baby, if you will, is larger than that of New Zealand. So, you know, there's a fair amount of, and not large enough, I, I imagine many would um, argue, because there is so much work to be done in terms of the surveying and mapping all of the things that our, our NOAA ships do. Uh, let's see, who am I going to pick on next? Lauren, how about you? What, what has surprised you the most? Yeah, yeah, I feel like it's truly the vastness for me as well. Um, learning about, you know, Christine's portfolio, space situational awareness, that was a phrase I didn't even know existed, making sure things in space that we've put up there don't crash into other things in space that we've put up there. Wild, uh, the amount of really interesting policy and math and, and thought that goes into that. Um, learning about how solar flares impact our communications here on Earth, wild, uh, learning about all of the deep sea ocean exploration happening here. Uh, there's, there's just so much really incredible work happening and such a wide ranging agency. And I love that underneath it all, everyone that I've worked with at NOAA is incredibly driven by the mission uh, that regardless as to what you're working on, everyone really deeply cares about conservation, about serving the American public, um, and about protecting lives and livelihoods. It's, it's a wonderful place to work. And I feel like I've been both amazed at, at how amazing the people are, how amazing and broad ranging the mission is, um, and just really grateful to work with, with such a cool crew working on everything from the surface of the sun to the bottom of the ocean, as we like to say, uh, it's, it's truly an incredible mission. Some days it does feel like our own version of everything everywhere all at once. Um, so Christine, how about how about you? What, what has been interesting and surprising to you about Noah? I hate to be repetitive, but um, have to second what the others have said about just the vastness of everything that Noah does. Even, I mean, starting with just the things that are space adjacent, I mean, NOAA runs this satellite operations facility that is like a mission control for our fleet of all the weather satellites. Um, and it, it operates it daily. It doesn't, um, and getting to leverage expertise like that on how do you handle all this data? And how do you make it accessible for people? How do you make it usable for people for what they need to maintain safety and to be able to coordinate internationally? Um, to just, like everyone said, the vastness of everywhere NOAA has an office and how it impacts everyday lives. Um, I, we took a family vacation to Alaska and it was my, actually my first time there and I saw a little NOAA office and I was like, oh, I kind of wish I had my badge. <laughs> like, um, and just like the way it touches every part of the country and across the globe as well. And the, I mostly appreciate getting to learn from everyone on the team as well. It's just a very dedicated um, and welcoming team. Yeah, I, I would underscore the generosity of our colleagues, um, both in the career ranks as well as the uh, folks who come in with this administration. So yes, indeed. Zach, how about you? 
Um, I'll take a different tactic than everybody else, although I do agree. Yeah, um, the, the pieces of Noah that I didn't know exist were definitely one of the first things I was kind of surprised about, you know, once you start getting out of your own portfolio. But uh, going the other way, like um, the, the fact that Noah is within the Department of Commerce and that we look kind of like no other bureau within the department um, has been interesting, particularly with how we, you know, go about decision making. And at times, I think early on when I got here, I was like, man, is it really a good idea for us to be in the Department of Commerce? And I've had many people explain why that is, um, you know, from you know, the time that, you know, we became an agency and you know, what we were before and just sort of the evolution and everything that we handle and how we continue to evolve within NOAA. But um, the more I thought about that, and I guess just the experience of being a senior advisor and um, just maybe for everybody's awareness, like, uh, you know, unlike I think probably some of my colleagues, like I, I didn't have a ton of no experience before I got here. I did not work for any of the line offices. So NOAA was kind of this, um, there's still mysteries of NOAA that I, I don't fully understand. But um, the more time that I've spent here and worked with different departments on things like endangered species and whatnot, um, I actually think uh, commerce is a pretty good fit uh, for NOAA. In, in many different ways. Um, I'm, I won't go too deep in why I think that, but I mean, just in terms of, you know, the conflicts that sometimes I'd say internal conflicts any bureau can have with its own department. I, interior is kind of an example where I'd say that, where you might have, you know, one bureau pushing for, you know, flows for endangered fish or keeping the lake levels high for a certain fish, whereas others may have to control how that water flows out somewhere. Uh, there's definitely things like that where, you know, I feel like, you know, again, as tribes or even other stakeholders look at the federal government and look at places where it can seem like we're schizophrenic. Um, I'm actually, the more I've thought about it, I, I think NOAA is in a pretty good place within Department of Commerce, just given, you know, some of those conflicts that can happen. Now, um, I'm sure there's, there's more to these stories, but I'd say that's just sort of a surprise and sort of, you know, the way we have the government set up to kind of address all of these different issues. And also just, you know, NOAA's um, breadth in terms of not just what's um, you know, the focus that we have on our own waters, but I mean, everything else, I mean, there's everything else, particularly in the oceans, um, will always have a major international piece to it. And so I think that breadth has also been um, sort of a, a place where I've definitely needed to um, recalibrate sort of everything that NOAA does and what we're responsible for. Thank you, Zach. Um, it, that is always an interesting question. Having been at NOAA before, it's uh, one that has reverberated throughout the decades. Um, I think I would also just point out that we're this administration and this leadership uh, within the department is probably the most integrated I've ever seen. And I've been a NOAA um, insider or adjacent for a very long time. Um, and so to see the Economic Development Administration working alongside NOAA, along with the uh, Patent and Trademark Office and, and others really like digging in on climate in particular has been so very interesting. Ali, I see your hand and I'm just gonna give Katie a quick chance to answer that question if she wants to um, add anything to the surprising elements of NOAA. Yeah, thank you, Lori. So I'll just quickly say, um, I think there are a lot of great comments that um, my colleagues made about the breadth of NOAA's mission um, and how rewarding it is to be caring, you know, really working to carry out that mis mission of service uh, stewardship and science. Um, and I will say for me, um, you know, I had worked uh, in previous roles in, in other jobs where I had, you know, a, a, a wider portfolio that I was working on or that I was overseeing with many different topics and issues. And so when it came to NOAA and was specifically focused on offshore wind, I thought, Oh, great. I get to focus on just one thing. Right. And I think I uh, undervalued or underappreciated the complexity of that one thing. So for me, I think the surprising part is my own specific portfolio and just how complicated it is. Um, and and uh, from sort of Noah's role, largely in, as consulting agency in offshore wind throughout the whole process of siting, leasing. Uh, and permitting and just the dynamics and the landscape and the players and really um, what it takes to do it right and how complex that is. So that's been surprising, but also motivating. Um, it's an enormous uh, and awesome challenge, but one that we have to achieve. Thank you, Katie. So Ali, what, what question would you like to pose? Yeah. And to whom? Yes, so th thank you, Lori, and thanks everyone for putting this on. So actually, Katie, that question was, a, or that answer was a great segue into 
um, my question, which is, I'm wondering, you know, particularly given some of the complexities you just described, what what do you all need from the community to be able to do your work? How how can we best support you as you're um, doing the great work that you're doing? If I could just make an overarching comment um, and say your engagement is the most valuable. Um, and uh, one of our colleagues who is not quite as new, in fact, she was day one, that's Emily McAuliffe, is now running external affairs for the agency in the communication shop. Um, delighted to have her. And so I would really encourage um, all of you to stay engaged, especially around the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. We have a huge opportunity and a huge responsibility to engage our communities, and those are physical communities as well as philosophical communities. Um, to make sure that you are aware that we have a bipartisan infrastructure law page, as well as an Inflation Reduction Act page, um, and to just, um, you know, folks aren't shy about sharing their love or challenges with NOAA, and so we would continue to ask you to do just that, because we cannot do our jobs collectively, particularly in policy advising roles, um, without having a true understanding of what's going on on the ground. And so let me turn it over to anybody else who would like to, you know, sort of add on to that from your own perspective. Zach, you're doing a lot of engagement. Anything that you would like to... <laughs> you would like but I, th I, th I thought I prefaced it with it not being the great engager, but no, I actually um, do have one thing I'd say on that. And I, I think it's along the lines of what Lori said, but um, from a Zach tribal perspective, when we did the Columbia Basin partnership, um, I a lot of the uh, treaty tribes in the Columbia Basin were very wary. They're, they're always going to be wary of sitting at the table with state non-sovereigns, so stakeholders, NGOs, because you know they're sovereigns and there's this distinction that should always be made. But one of the things that I think I came away from that process with, and this is a this doesn't go for NOAA, but you know, what a philosophy a lot of tribes that I've worked for that I'm from have is um, you know, a role that tribes have always had, and I think a lot of humans have this responsibility is to be that voice for the fish, to be that voice for the ecosystem. And tribes are a minority now. I mean, it's it's a it's a fact of you know the history of our country, and so our voices uh, don't always put in a lot of votes. But a place where I found that um, the ocean community stakeholders, whether it's speaking for orcas, whether it's speaking for you know salmon, um, the power that's encased in that voice. Is, 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 is really big. And I think that those voices just when you get, you know, the sheer amount of voices actually, because a lot of the things that we talk about, at least on the fishery side of things, and again, in Zach's opinion is, you know, some of these things are not necessarily getting another data point, where we're going to fix everything. It's about a social change and how we actually live within the environment. And the more people that start to understand that and the people that learn sort of um, I guess, how we go about maybe changing some of the things that we do. That's where that power is at. So that's sort of my answer. Thank you, Zach. Anybody like to add an additional thought to that as we're just about at time and wrapping up? All right. With that, I thank you one and all for taking time out of your busy days to learn more about some of our amazing colleagues. There are um, 11,994 more of us um, around the nation. So lots and lots of people to engage with. Um, and we thank you for your interest in NOAA and um, keep, keep on connecting with us. Thank you, everybody.